first, if you could, we'd love for you to uh, tell us your name, tell us um, you know, what you do, and um, you know why your work is important to you. Absolutely. So I'm Kier Miller. Um, I'm a lead on the merchandise and vendor development team at Target, where my team really stands up for diverse and or women-owned brands. And what that means is really twofold, identifying and sourcing diverse and women-owned brands and aligning them with our merchants at Target and aligning them within um, assortment strategies that, to make sure that it fits not only uh, from a brand perspective, but from a guest perspective. We also look for those disruptive and innovative brands that you can't get anywhere else. And um, that really can, again, kind of goes back to filling that gap, uh, assortment gap at Target. Uh, the second fold to that is not only do we source and identify brands, but we also help with for growth, for, or, excuse me, growth and retention. So, you know, half the battle is getting on shelf, but the other half is staying there. And Target and myself are really, really passionate about making sure that not only do we bring in man brands that are meaningful, but brands that see longevity at Target and really honing in on that generational wealth and really providing equity, uh, not just from the front end, but throughout their uh, experience at Target. And I think the last question and why I chose to go into this and why this particular work is so important is because uh, first and foremost, representation matters. You know, um, we have to be able to see ourselves in all of the facets that uh, this industry comes in, and, and that includes retail. You know, it, it's important to be able to not only um, bring a diverse assortment to guests, but it also comes along with diverse perspectives. A lot of our brands have amazing stories. Um, and what they've gone through in retail and their journey on entrepreneurship. And we're just here to help close that gap and hopefully be able to share their stories uh, with our guests, you know, near and far. That's what, I mean, that's pretty powerful. And I like that um, because it's, you know, what I call, you know, just transformational work, um, mm -hmm. transformational work that's purpose driven. Uh, mm -hmm. I love how, you know, you seem to, have just kind of taken your own personal conviction and brought that also to the space to impact the space you're in and impact the space that um, that you operate in. So I think that's super dope. That's uh, wonderful. And like I was saying, I think that work is um, really, really, it speaks to just kind of their own personal conviction um, in the space, but also I love it how there's a important part of transformation that is a part of helping businesses to grow not only get in, but stay in, right? Yes. Um, yeah. What kinds of um, questions do you get um, after, how do I get into Target? Mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of questions do you get uh, from entrepreneurs who are interested in scaling their business and using mm -hmm. Target as a part of, part of that model or even retail, larger retail as a part of that model? What, what kind of question do you get? And also, how do you guide them along that, that process? No, that's a really good question. And I think probably top of mind, the question I get the most from entrepreneurs that I meet is, you know, how can I be in all Target stores? <laughs> you know, and I say that to say, um, that's not always the best approach. You know, as I look at brands and the team looks at brands, our first and North Star is always, you know, how can we scale your business in a meaningful way? So that not only can you learn the business of playing at a mass retailer um, and then also uh, get acclimated to just the, the ins and outs of your business on this new scale. Um, for example, uh, I was talking to a brand the other day and they were just like, we want to be in all Target stores. And I started to ask the questions of, you know, uh, what your capabilities look like? How many products can you make in a week's time period? If I sent you a PO for 10,000 units, are you going to be able to turn that back over to me in a two-week time frame? And, you know, the answer was no. And so it kind of connects the dots in terms of we want to make sure that we bring you in in, a, a again, a meaningful way that's not just meaningful for us, but you as well. 
And so sometimes that means, you know, starting off online or starting off in the stores. There's totally nothing wrong with starting small to scale your business because not only does that help you in the long run so that you're buttoned up and you know what's to come, like the, the fees, associated fees of being at a mass retailer, getting your logistics together in terms of ensuring that you ship on time. Like those are things that you learn along the way. Uh, it's not, not necessarily a playbook of this is going to happen. You, you never know, you know, in this economics and, and in times, things fluctuate all the time. And so you have to be able to pace yourself and really take in the process to go through it to scale. Um, how we help with that and guiding that is, you know, first and foremost, again, understanding your business, the ins and outs of your business. So, you know, I may ask questions around your logistics. Who do you have um, delivering products? Is it direct to consumer? Would you like to leverage um, our logistics company? How are we going to lay that out? Um, as I spoke to earlier, capabilities. Um, where are you producing your items or and, or doing your service at? Is it regulated? <laughs> Has it been audited? Do you have sustainability uh, policies? You know, those are all things that come into play. And then also, um, you know, something else that I tell people all the time is like, you know, make sure that you know the ins and outs of your business from a financial standpoint. And so if I ask you, like, what's the cost per unit? And you give me a cost or what's your proposed retail and you give me one, you know, does it align to the merchant or retailer that you're trying to go into? Can you see your product on shelves from a price point perspective, a packaging perspective, um, all of those things. And again, when I have those conversations with Brandon at the end of it, it may not be a good fit. And that's not to say that's a no forever. It's all in timing, you know. It may not be the right time for this fall transition, but springtime comes around, you have a new buyer, they have new strategies in place, you may be a perfect fit there. So again, I think it's, um, you know, just for me as I guide brands, it's really digging into their business and uh, identifying maybe areas of opportunity or gaps that may lie so that we can address them and then set you up for success when it is time to have like a line review with the buyer to get your product and uh, a retailer. That's great. I love that. I, I like everything about that. I think also that that aspect of really making someone, making sure someone knows their numbers, I think is key because just because, you know, just because someone creates something doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right fit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or something, a place where they see on commercials, right? And sometimes we have things built up in our head about what something will be. And then yes. the reality is, um, can be a lot different. And so yeah. being able to, again, you help businesses along the way, help them to understand that, you know, this is real life, it's not a pipe dream. And no. yeah, yeah, and, but people, they have, they have things that they build up, especially when how they see their business being successful. But I okay. love how you can help steward you know uh, them along the way and the other part is it's different levels of entrepreneurship and different levels of business um yeah. i think there are quite a few entrepreneurs that have dreams of hey i have a product i create this thing i have a better deodorant i have a better uh service i have a better mm -hmm. product of uh that's natural and i don't see in the marketplace target needs this and they still seem like they are maybe solving a problem for a consumer but how that looks could be different. Like you said, it could be an online solution. So it could be, um, you know, something in a regional uh, situation as opposed to national. So it sounds yeah. like in some cases you can be a, like the professional, like bubble popper, right? So, yeah. hey, but it's it's really helping businesses to be successful and they may not. Yeah. So I think good businesses kind of understand that. So I love those things that you explain. When it comes to um, just making space for people to build generational wealth. You know, what, um, I know we talked a little bit about this last week, but what place do you see products being sold, uh, things being done in larger retailers and opportunities being made? What, what part do you see Target playing in that or even just your role being a conduit for those kind of conversations? 
Absolutely. So I feel like from Target's perspective, you know, a couple places where we really try to hone in that to amplify that um, pipeline and experience for diverse brands is one, the education piece. You know, I felt like we were one of the first retailers to really stand up uh, formalized programming that helps entrepreneurs at any phase of their entrepreneurship because there's some that are just starting and may not know just kind of those fundamentals of like what's a markup, what's out of stock rate, um, what's a proposed retail versus a cost. You know, there's programming around for those uh, entrepreneurs at the beginning of their phase, and then there's programming for those entrepreneurs that. Uh, they're pretty retail ready. There, there may just be a little couple things that they may just need polishing, whether it's regarding how to go through and create a line review deck to present to your buyer or how to button up a little bit more about like your brand positioning or whatnot and how to speak buyer language. You know, so I feel like one, the education piece, Target does an amazing job with um standing up programming that meets the entrepreneur in their journey. Those programs, uh, they're called accelerator teams at Target. And so there's two programs there within that team. One is Target Takeoff, and then the other one is Forward Founders, which address both of those scenarios that I just kind of laid out in terms of where they're at on their journeys. Um, They're both like six-week robust programs that, I mean, it's very time-consuming, but when you get on the other side, there hasn't yet been a brand that hasn't been able to take what that curriculum has given them and really been able to apply it to their businesses. And even some have been able to transition from just a prospective buyer to a buyer on shelves. Um, I think the second thing that Target does an amazing job at is, um, again, that piece of meeting entrepreneurs where they're at. So Get, get it in the communities where our entrepreneurs reside, work at, do business at, and really engage with them to understand what are some of those pain points that you're going through. The thing top of mind is uh, cash flow, equity. Like these are small emerging brands that, you know, are when you think of the larger scale of like a Pepsi or something like that, they're a small fish in, a, in, in the ocean, you know, and so. How do we take that information and continue to create strategy and initiatives that support them, whether it's from a financial standpoint of, um, you know, um, having certain fees waived or whether it's, um, you know, having a little bit, my team in general, like this team is a newly developed team that really helps brands be able to, um, again, scale at a mass retailer. And to be honest, the information that we give them, I I tell brands all the time, like, I would love you to be at Target, but I want to equip you with the tools and the knowledge and resources to be able to scale and go to any retailer and you feel confident that you're going into a scenario well-equipped to do business that's a win-win for both you (laughs) uh, and the retailer too. Uh, that community piece, though, I feel like that's personally my favorite because, again, we are able to really meet them where they're at, whether it's through um, local uh, community initiatives, such as like um, a brand is doing samples at the Boys and Girls Club or something like that. Like, we want to be there to help support. It can go as big as Essence. You know, Target sponsored was one of the main retailers at Essence this, uh, this past summer. And we really were able to amplify our Black-owned band brands in a major way, you know, something that's never been done at Target before. And so I think those two things are really uh, North Stars for us as we uh, understand diverse businesses and also how we help grow, you know, diverse businesses. That's pretty powerful, Kira. Um, that's super <laughs> dope. In my words, <laughs> because we need that. You know, we need support beyond, you know, just the transactional part. And oh, I yeah. love how you're placing business, giving businesses a space and opportunity for them just to scale, uh, you know, with or without Target. They have the mm-hmm. knowledge that can't be taken away for them to know how to yeah. be successful entrepreneurs and have yeah. successful brands in general. And if you're mm-hmm. giving them that kind of value, like who, who wouldn't want to 
you know, be with Target. You know what I mean? So I, I love, I love that. I also love the community part as well, whether mm-hmm. in a region or in places where Target can uh, elevate the brands, like an Essence mm-hmm. Fest or some kind of larger event. Um, that's so much benefit all the way around. So that's that's incredible. Um, thank you for that. My last couple questions are, and I know we spoke about this before a bit. Um, and so when it comes to um, the space of uh, supplier diversity, um, mm-hmm. the space of having diverse suppliers who want to work in an institution like Target, um, I know Target has a very strong, um, is very strong in the DEI space, but mm-hmm. for those who are service providers, those who are wanting to provide services either regionally or nationally, what does that look like? From target stand, from target standpoint, I know that's different from getting products, and yeah. but there's still a space where, you know, someone who has or a service based company or something else mm-hmm. that can fit to the organization could still um, work with Target in some different ways. So could you speak to that a bit and how that works? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a sister team that does exactly what we do. From where my team is considered the direct side, and then we have an indirect side from a supplier diversity standpoint that handles all of the service bits, such as like um, constructions on existing uh, target stores or, you know, things like that. Um, Or if we have a diverse uh, manufacturer that can produce uh, actual soft line goods, such as apparel or accessories, um, that team is amazing. They, they really have, uh, they really have dove deep in that, in that area of business to say like how can we amplify diverse brands in a way that hasn't been amplified before such as like having um diverse owned contractors add on or build to new or existing target stores um i'm actually working on a project now where um we have the opportunity to work with um a handful of black farmers to help produce some raw, they they produce some raw materials that will go into some of our textile pieces, such as like your cotton t-shirts or um, other like just uh, apparel accessories. But it's it's having and building those relationships where it's not just that transactional piece, whereas you're it's an actual tangible item, but it's like really peeling back that onion to say like, how can I leverage or how can we amplify your talents? You know, we have pro bono programs that allow um, Black designers to come in and create assortments for us for like Black History Month that um, I feel like Target does an amazing job every year with curating assortment for Black History Month that is created by Black creatives and designers that are designed by Black creatives and designers and really, um, really, really uh, cater towards our Black guests um, that shop at Target. And so that team has been doing amazing things. And even myself having a product development background, like I felt like that's been my thing coming into Target is like, all right, how can we uh, continue to amplify our diverse businesses in a creative way and, and, and doing just that from that indirect service and finding um, black production facilities, black manufacturing or diverse uh, manufacturing facilities to help aid in some of these initiatives that um, we have coming down the pipeline in 2023 and beyond. That's great. That's great. To, to piggyback off of that, you know, some people may assume, oh, I'm too small or I don't have this or I don't have that. It, it could happen, but maybe not. And I'm all about not having limiting language when mm-hmm. it comes to what you think your possibilities are. If you think you're not going to happen, it's not going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, but if you, um, but in terms of how that can come together for a, in a place like Target, are there second tier opportunities? Are there um, events and meetups where people can come to? Meetups, I'm losing that term loosely, but yeah, some yeah. Other events uh, where they can come to to meet buyers and so forth. How can a, a business uh, put themselves in position to have the conversation? Absolutely. So a couple of ways. Um, I always tell brands that are starting off um, in their journey of entrepreneurship is get acclimated to the landscape. And by that, I mean, like, 
go to expos that are related to your business. So like Expo East, Expo West, there's thousands of vendors there that come and showcase their products in an organic way where you're going to come across all of the buyers and supplier diversity people from all of the major retailers, you have them under one roof. And so that's always an opportunity to go learn and see what other brands are doing, more seasoned brands are doing. And so taking some of that that you can apply to your business, figuring out, hey, is this the right uh, place for my product, whether it be um, a food and beverage item or it's an apparel item or even a, a service uh, that you provide um, start to put yourself out there and expose yourself at some of these expos and start networking. You know, building that network, building that board of directors will go a world of difference because if you can start having conversations with these people that have been in your shoes, I guarantee you, you'll be able to find gems and nuggets that you can be able to apply uh, to your business uh, to grow it. Um, a couple other ways that I feel like is, is good to like meet and greet, um, you know, prospective buyers from other retailers. Um, I know retailers are really starting to have um, kind of like pop up accelerator events throughout cities. I know, um, you know, at Target, we're trying to work with um, some key pillars in the community, like in Atlanta, in DC, of um, places that our incubators for black owned businesses or just diverse owned businesses. And we're starting to create those relationships where we can like amplify and stand up for those to be like a centralized event of like, hey, come meet some target people to talk about your business. Um, so we're doing those types of things. And then also um, something that's always important and I know it's not for everyone at the beginning, but like getting certified. So what that means is like becoming a national uh, minority supplier or um, getting certification through WeBank, which is like women's own business, you know, things like that. They have countless and countless um, programming events with every retailer you can think of that allows you free access um, to not only uh, just trending topics of the industry, whether it's crowdsourcing or uh, cash flow or how to create an assortment strategy. Like they hit on all these angles of entrepreneurship that is so powerful, you know, and I know for certifications, it does cost. So I'm always transparent with brands like it's not free, but I, I will also say and stand up that I think having that certification just opens you up to such a broader network. And a lot of times it doesn't even you necessarily don't even have to leave home. You can watch a, and attend a lot of these programs right in the comfort of your home. And so a big thing to that is like, there are going to be times where you have to invest in yourself and you have to figure out what, what areas do you deem important that you need to invest in. Maybe it's the education piece. Maybe it's the marketing piece, but never be afraid to invest in yourself. You know, it, it, it's it's so it's so important, not just for the now, um, but for the long term as well, or long run, excuse me, as well. Kiri, you preaching good. No, <laughs> no, 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 I know, I understand. I appreciate that. Thank you for that feedback. You know, putting yourself in the room, um, investing in yourself, identifying where um, the places are where the buyers will be, and just being unafraid to make those steps. So that would produce the fruit that we say we want. You know, mm -hmm. I think um, all those different points you made are are key. And so, mm -hmm. um, and thank you for also even mentioning being nationally certified. I think it's surprising the people who don't know uh, about the National Minority Supplier Development Council mm -hmm. and understand what it means to be a certified minority-owned business mm -hmm. or even WeBank. And yep. um, both powerful institutions that were created to help advocate and put businesses mm -hmm. in a place to um have their goods or services uh purchased by large corporations and so um but yeah no this is wonderful is there anything else that you want to add or you think um you know entrepreneurs uh business owners of color you know really need to know when it comes to either getting in target or just kind of scaling their business or positioning themselves uh, to succeed 
You know, a couple of things. Um, I'd say the first thing is um, be afraid to fail. And I say that in the most encouraging way. Um, in this retail industry, there's going to be lots of no's. And a lot of times those no's are going to prepare you for the path that you are to be on. You know, um, and when I say that, you know, I there's brands that have line reviews with buyers, tons of buyers. And each time they look at it as like, oh, they said no, they said no. It's all in timing. Mm-hmm. Buyers change desks all the time. With new buyers, typically there's new strategies. Every buyer comes in and they're like, I want to do stuff my way, this way. And with those new mindsets and strategies, could be an area of opportunity for you that once that wasn't there maybe six months ago or a year ago. So I, I say that to say, um, don't be afraid of failing. It, it's it's going to happen in this line of business. I think it's how you recover from those fail, failures, take from it, and really be able to say, okay, what's my next move? Like where do I um, where do I pivot? I think the second thing is um, really do your homework in terms of what and where you want to be at. Mm. Not every retailer is a good opportunity for you, whether that's from a price point perspective, an assortment perspective, always come into the retailer being authentically you. Do not come into these meetings um, and the buyer or person may say like, oh, we love your product, but maybe the packaging is off or name changed or whatnot. Do what's best for your business. If you have space to be able to adjust and it doesn't, um, you know, change who you are as a brand, hey, go for it. But if you find yourself having to do a lot of changes that aren't necessarily what you stand for, take a step back to think like, okay, is this a good opportunity for me outside of the monetary perspective and like the visibility perspective? Like, is it going to allow me to stand on my brand and like really, um, move forward in a way that's authentic um, to you. And then also, again, on that homework piece, um, really do your homework in terms of like how your product fits. I have brands that come in all the time and they act like, you know, brand positioning. How is your product different from X brand? And I hear so many answers sometimes of, because mine tastes better or it's just better that's not going to fly and that's not going to <laughs> that's not going to uh, go well most of the time. I know buyers, merchants, they like to see concrete data to show uh, why your brand is different or what makes your brand unique. Maybe it's ingredients, maybe it's packaging. Maybe you have a community pillar involved in your product that you give 1% of your proceeds to a certain organization. Always stand on the things that make you unique from the rest outside of, you know, the opinion <laughs> based stuff of like, well, mine's just better. Merchants and our teams want to know like what makes your product unique and why we need it, um, you know, in this space. And again, to that, you know, stay, stand, stay hold to like the really understand your financial metrics mm-hmm. and understand. And don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to negotiate. Don't like have a voice. And, and again, that's where my team and things come in to really prep brands to be like, if, if, if you're proposing a cost of uh, $3 and uh, the buyer wants to, like, it's okay to negotiate. The worst they can say is no, but uh, don't be afraid to, to not negotiate because those little things can really close a business if you get into something blindly and and that's real like if you go into something and you're not ready to scale it at the rate that that retailer is expected um unfortunately there's instances where the charges and fees can really close a business and we never want to see that happen we never want that to occur so that's why i feel like my team we are very transparent, we're very direct, but it's all out of a place of love because we want to make sure that we're setting you up for success so that you have longevity down the road and it's not so transactional, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think those are the main things that I love to, I like to tell 
entrepreneurs and brands, like just, you know, stay true to who you are and the right opportunity will align with you at the right time or whatnot. Mm. That's powerful. <laughs> no, thank you very much. No, I appreciate it. This is wonderful. And um, yeah, I'll be, thank you for your insight and just your contributions. And thank you for you know, everything you do just from the heart, you know, uh, to mm -hmm. help and how you pour yourself into your responsibility into your community and communities um, around the country. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, I know people who work with you. I appreciate that as well. So yeah, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for the time. I, I really enjoyed myself today. <laughs> yes, yes.